Good morning, God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. I trust that you're well and uh, we're in for an exciting message that may transform our lives and the lives of those that we love. So uh, God bless you. If you're watching for the first time, welcome. Uh, if you're a regular, I encourage you to share these videos because they could really bless other people, Christians and non Christians as well alike. So Father we just thank you for this time with you this morning. I pray Father that your truth would reign in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well if you want a title for today's topic uh, we are looking at the end times and it is a brief guide to the end times. Almost like just looking at a timetable as to what lies ahead not just for the church, but for humanity. Okay, so this doesn't just to apply to the Christian, it applies to the non-believer as well. That we hope if you're a non-believer, you would come into the saving grace and love of God through watching these messages. Uh, uh, as we've been in lockdown, uh, I pray that you've maximised the grace that God has given us. And I believe that this lockdown has been a worldwide season of grace for the whole world to just stop to pause to evaluate their lives what is what is of real value what is real what do they value what did what do we not value what's a distraction and what is of worth and more than that what is the bigger picture to our lives what is man scripture said but just a vapor who is here one minute and gone the next well thankfully we are like that in terms of the time we're on the earth, but we're not like that in our importance to God, who is a heavenly Father who loves us. So uh, it seems like there has been a turning of the page in the uh, the book of time, as it were. You know, a speeding up in the end time situation and stuff that we're moving into. So let's have a brief look as to what the word says about the future. What is the timetable then that lies ahead uh, for humanity from this point to Armageddon, as it were, the second coming? Now, I'm sure not everybody will agree with all the points in this, uh, in this preach this morning, but do you know what? Even my own family can't agree on what video to watch on a Saturday night sometimes. We sit there and we put them behind our back and we're trying to choose. And normally we go with majority rule in our little uh, democracy in the guest household. But, uh, you know, there's lots of things that people disagree with in life. But we continue to love and honour and respect even when we disagree. But I trust that this would be probably the wider agreement of the church on these end time facts. So, uh, nevertheless, the important question we all need to ask ourselves is, if the end were to come tomorrow, where do we stand with God ourselves? You know, where do we stand? Well, we can stand in several places. We can stand uh, as a non-believer, and that would be horrific in many ways. We can stand as a believer, but who's not really practicing, not don't really believe. Your lifestyle's never really changed. You've got a head knowledge, but it's never it's never impacted your life. You know, uh, you think that there, there might be a God, but you've never surrendered your life to Him. Well, to be honest, that's a bad category. Or maybe you're there and you are a believer, but you're hurting, you're discouraged, so on and so forth. Or you're there and you're on fire for the Lord and you're walking close with Jesus. Well, whatever place you're at, the wonderful joy is, do you know what, we can just, we can just ask God to touch our lives and instantly we will be in the right place, no matter where we are. So I encourage you, walk close with the Lord, get on fire with God. God doesn't flirt with us. He paid the price for us. If we're believers, if we're Christians, then we belong to the Lord and we should act and live according to who we belong to. You know, sometimes our private lives, our social lives and stuff like that, 
don't actually reflect that we are Christians. In actual fact, sometimes that's the fruit that we're, we're not Christians in reality. Uh, one thing I would say right now, I believe wholeheartedly in eternal security. I believe if we've made Jesus our Lord and it is a genuine conversion, we are eternally saved. There's no tippets in heaven. We are bought and paid for by Jesus. We have the gift of eternal life, which means eternal life, which doesn't get taken away. And we can rest secured, for we do not live in fear. Why? Because perfect love has cast out all fear. We have no fear of of failing or not making the mark because we already know that we can't make the mark and we need Jesus. Uh, so be secure in that. But equally, it's, I wouldn't say it's a matter of uh, do I believe one can lose their salvation? No. My bigger question is, is a person really saved? They might have said a prayer, they might have gone to church on and off, they might have bought a Bible out of being inquisitive. Maybe their parents went to church. I know many pastors who brought their children uh, up in church life and that, but then the children have walked away and said, you know, I, I just it's not for me. I don't want to live that life. And they, they have that freedom, sadly, to do that. And so I think it's not a matter of are we eternally saved? I think are we saved is actually the question. Did we truly repent? Was there a change of mindset, a change of lifestyle? Yes, of course, we will always slip up with sin. Every one of us. Jesus said, let he who is without sin throw the first stone. Okay? And nobody threw a stone. Why? Because we were all plagued with that. Now, I'm talking about a genuine love for the Lord where we're seeking God and his kingdom and we are doing our utmost to live according to the word. And when we do drop the ball, when we do go wrong, and God alone knows, as you probably know, I've done many times, be, be fast to repent, be sincere in your repentance, and God will forgive us. So, where do you stand? You know, what is the fruit of your life and your thoughts? Well, let's try on with what we're looking at. Over the last 2,000 years, humanity has been living in a period called grace. In many uh, in many ways, really, when Jesus died and uh, defeated Satan at the cross and was resurrected, that in many ways should have been it. That, that, that should be it. But God in his grace and his love for you and for I has given us a season called grace, which has been the last 2,000 years in which we have, as the human race, been living. And many generations believe that right now we are the end time generation. We are the last point of grace before the book moves or the trumpet sounds to move in the next phase of the end times of humanity. But we have lots of evidence that uh, we are that end times generation. We just have to look around and we see the signs that are all the time in our face about uh, how things are changing in humanity, leading us to this end time stage. We can look at some simple things like we've done many times, that money is starting to go out of circulation, as in cash. You, use, you know, you can use it, 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 buy everything without using cash anymore. We look at the, the use of technology, how it isolates and so on and so forth, and how it can be used wrong. We look at uh, euthanasia, abortion and stuff like that. We look at this antichrist generation, this worldwide movement to remove God out of schools and God out of hospitals and God out of hotels where you used to get a little New Testament. Moving God out of society and replacing it with something else. That's actually the meaning of antichrist. It's not against Christ, it's the replacement. We're seeing the replacement of Christ in society, the replacement of the Bible and the biblical standard. Uh, men have become lovers of self. You know, it's all about me, myself and I, and what's best for me, myself and I. My family, my future, my desire, my opinion. An increase in 
immorality and sin and we see it so easily. Just watch your TV and you see the types of programs which are now mainstream, which years ago would have been seen as pornographic. It's now mainstream entertainment. And you know, the, the whole moral fibre has changed. What we deem to be acceptable and normal now. I mean, what's frightening, I saw a little video about uh, uh, paedophilia that these scientists were saying, well, in actual fact, this is a norm, this is another uh, option of sexual activity, and that humans haven't really got a choice, you know. Uh, the, the whole moral cold and fibre of society being ripped down. Wars and rumours of wars constantly. Uh, pestilence and plagues around the world, famines, we see fires, some countries on fire constantly almost, and then others continually being flooded. The return of the Jewish nation to Israel, you know, thousands upon thousands of Jews returning to their homeland, not just uh, first generation Jews, but others who their ancestors went to America and different countries and they're now second or third or fourth generation and they're deciding to go back to Israel now and fill in this call. We've just seen uh, uh, the Americans acknowledge that the capital of Israel isn't actually Tel Aviv but Jerusalem and moving their headquarters there. And then we see like family disorder. You know, the, the whole breakdown of family and the family structure and children in the end times rebelling against their parents and society and a general lawlessness in society. You know, nation against nation, people against people, tribe against tribe. And we just see a breakdown of the fabric of the moral law of God in society. And that gives us a, a, a very clear indication of the days we're living in. And God has given us plenty of warning through all the events. We are not without excuse. If Christ was to come like a thief in the night and catch us unaware, you know, we're not without excuse. In actual fact, Scripture says, regardless of all those signs and everything, just the beauty and wonder of his creation, God's creation, looking out the window and seeing the beauty of a butterfly, the wonder of a mountain, the elements of the universe, knowing that that itself is a signature of God as the supreme creator of all things. Wow. So we need to be ready. If you're not ready as a Christian, we need to quicken our spirits and allow the Lord to do this for you this morning. So let's look at this timetable then. And so we've seen 2,000 years of church history and really the next big, uh, big mark on the page is what is known as the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. Now, the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible at all. Uh, but the event appears several times and is prophesied in the New Testament. Now, some might say, well, if the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible, I don't believe in it. Well, by the same measure, then, you don't believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, because in actual fact, the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible, but the essence of the Trinity is very clear, and nobody would argue that there isn't a Trinity. Likewise with the word rapture. So what is, is the rapture and what is it all about? The word rapture comes from a Latin word called raptio, 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 which means caught up. It means to be caught up, to be gathered together, to be pulled away, to be caught up. It refers to a prophetic event which Christ will call the church up into the air with him. That is, the body of Christ, the believers, all the Christians worldwide will be called up into the sky. And uh, in other words for rapture, or the rapture of the church, is the removal of the church from the earth, or the removal of God's people from the earth. 
This event is a future event and has not happened yet. If it has happened, you, me, and anybody else watching are in trouble. Okay? So we know it hasn't happened yet, but this is an event where God will remove his church. That's all the believers. And there have been some films about this that you might watch that dramatise it, or I haven't watched many of them. I know there's one with Nicolas Cage in. But, uh, so let's turn to the word. Let's turn to first. Thessalonians chapter 4, verse Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. Now just a bit of background first. First Thessalonians is one of the first letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, some years after his conversion, Paul spent three weeks in Thessalonica in Greece. And I remember being there years ago. I was on my way to Macedonia on a uh, aid uh, on a, taking aid to uh, to Macedonia, in actual fact, to the Kosovo refugees. And I slept in Thessalonica airport on the floor with my bags tied around my feet. So if while I was asleep, if anyone would try and nick them, it would wake me up. And that's by the by. Uh, now some believers believed, uh, now talking of the scripture, some believers believed that uh, they had, uh, some had died, uh, uh, some were being persecuted after Paul had left them. Paul sent Timothy to check on them, and on his return, he told Paul that, in actual fact, the church in Thessalonica was struggling with issues of death and also the topic of the rapture of the church and what would happen to those who had died, uh, so on and so forth. So Paul replies to them, and he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed. Some, uh, some translation says ignorant, but uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. What a wonderful, beautiful scripture for the believer. Okay, Even when we face death in our own lives or the lives of those that we love, if they're believers, Paul says clearly, we do not want you... Uh, to grieve, so he says grieve, but we don't want you to grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Because for the believer, the physical death is not the end. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. All the, that's all the Christians, when Christ returns, all the Christians who have died since Pentecost according to the word of the Lord. We tell you that we who are still alive or who are left unto the end of the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and the left will be caught up or raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so that we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So there you go. So Paul is saying that when a believer dies, his soul goes immediately into the presence of the Lord, into heaven, and uh, one day without any warning, God will bring or allow Jesus uh, to return to receive the rest of the church who have died since Pentecost to be reunited in the air with their resurrection body. So all those who have died basically have been in the presence of the Lord uh, in their soul. But when Jesus returns to take the rest of the church, those who are alive, uh, he will come with them, all of those will come and they will receive their new resurrection bodies in the air. Okay, so they'll be given new bodies which will just be absolutely amazing. Then the church on the earth, all the Christians who are still alive on the earth will be taken up in the air and we also will be changed into our resurrection bodies and we will join the believers who have already got theirs and Jesus will then take us to heaven, okay? So the, the rapture of the church is not the second advent, it's Jesus returning to the 
to the atmosphere of the earth with all the saints, all the believers who have died, my mum and dad, your mum and dad, whatever, all these saints will be in the air and they, at that point they're going to receive their new resurrection bodies and at that point all the believers on the earth who are alive will suddenly disappear in the twinkling of an eye and we will meet with all those saints and with Jesus in the air we'll be given our new resurrection bodies and then we will proceed into heaven at this point. The rapture of the church is the removal of the church from the earth. Here's another scripture written by Paul explaining the same event. The rapture or the removal of the church. 1 Corinthians 15.51 1 Corinthians 15.51 Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but will be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Hallelujah. What an exciting scripture. The dead will rise and be raised imperishable and we will be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, that means a blink. That quick, as quick as a blink, we're to be changed. So one day you're driving your car, the next minute you're in heaven. One day you're clocking in at work, the next minute you're in heaven. One day you're, you're dive, jumping off a diving board into the swimming pool, you're in heaven. It will literally be like that. Millions of believers disappearing at the same point of time globally. That's the rapture of the church. My friends, if you're not a believer and you see these things happen, remember the word of God. Hallelujah. If you are a believer, let's be ready. Uh, because currently we are at the point in time when, when there's nothing to say this cannot happen imminently, right now. Paul says that it's a mystery. He was talking of that because not everything had been revealed before. The church is not mentioned in the Old Testament. The church was a mystery to the Israelites. The Israelites saw it as just them and the God, their God and them and the Gentiles. But the church was Gentiles who would believe in the Jewish God and believe in the Messiah. It was a complete mystery to the, to the Jews. Ephesians 5.32, Ephesians 5.32, it says, This is a profound mystery that I am talking about Christ and his church. A profound mystery. No one saw it coming, none of the Jews at all. Paul was saying would be changed in a flash. That a flash is the smallest bit of time that you can measure. You, it ends up so small you can't actually measure it anymore. That's how quick it will happen. The rapture of the church is not to be confused with the second coming or the second advent or some called Armageddon of which the Jews knew very well. These were two different events. The rapture will happen before the second coming. Why will Christ come to remove the church? Well, in Jewish culture, in the culture of the Jews, see, the, the church is named as the bride of Christ. That is our identity. We are his bride. He is the bridegroom and we are the bride. Well, when in Jewish culture uh, people got married, there was not a ceremony as such. There was a celebration. The two parties with their parents agreed that the wedding would take place. And on the day of the wedding, the bridegroom would come along with his chariot or his horse or his donkey, depending on how wealthy he was, would come along to the bride's house and simply pick her up, collect her, receive her to himself. From there, they would go directly to the reception the celebration. There was no church service. There was no exchange in the vows or anything. It was simply the removal of the bride. That was the covenant. That was the wedding. Well, here we see Jesus said he's coming back for what? 
for his bride. The minute the church is raptured, that we are the bride of Christ. That is the wedding. That's the covenant fulfilled. So from the point of the rapture of the church, we go directly into heaven to the celebration of the wedding, the celebration feast. How wonderful. Amen? And we're in the presence of Jesus. Then the church will be presented before the judgment seat of Christ and we will be rewarded for our works. Hallelujah. So we'll be rewarded. So now at the point of the rapture of the church, the next phase then comes in immediately, which is the tribulation or what some call the great tribulation. Now, we go through tribulation right now through the world. Each one of us face different trials and struggles and tribulations and oppression. But this is where the Bible is talking about a specific event, amount of time set aside for the Antichrist to rule. And it is called the tribulation that will take place. And the minute the church leaves, the tribulation is the next event that starts. I hope, I hope you're doing all right. I hope you're with me. Give me a thumbs up if you're following me this morning. Uh, it is expected to last seven years. The first three and a half years will be fairly peaceful. The Antichrist will be ruling and will be, begin to govern the world globally, probably a great political or military figure. But the second half, the second three and a half years, will be a terrible time, uh, often described as Jacob's troubles, that uh, as such that uh, the world had never seen wars and uh, lawlessness and depravity has never been seen before since the days of Noah. Now during this period lawlessness will increase because the Holy Spirit who's known as the restrainer has been removed. Why has the Holy Spirit been removed at this point? Because the Holy Spirit is living inside of every believer he has sealed each one of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when the believers, the church, is raptured, so the Holy Spirit is taken with us. So then suddenly the earth is functioning without the Holy Spirit, which at the moment restrains evil and holds evil back. And so once the restrainer is removed, you will see an outpouring of absolute evil and devastation. So Daniel 9.27, Daniel 9.27 indicates a crucial part of this seven-year tribulation period. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. This is a seven years or otherwise known as a week. In the middle of the seven, the so half of seven is three and a half, he will put an end to the sacrifice offerings at the temple and where he will set up the abomination that causes desolation. A desolation means a state of complete emptiness, complete destruction, complete terror. Until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. This person of whom it speaks uh, uh, is Antichrist, or otherwise known as the beast in their revelations. Daniel 27 says the beast will make a covenant for seven years, but in the middle of the seven years, or this week, three and a half years, into the tribulation, he will break the covenant and he will stop all sacrifices. He will erect a statue of himself in the Holy of Holies, in the Temple of God in Jerusalem. Revelation 13 explains that the beast will erect an image of himself in the, in the temple and he will then require that world, the world, uh, humanity worldwide worship him, that he should be worshipped. Revelation 13.5 and Daniel 9.27 says that this will happen in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven years. Revelation 13.5 says 
that the base will do this for a period of 42 months. So it's easy to see that the total length of time, if, if this is right, the total length of time, therefore, is 74 months in total. Well, 74, uh, sorry, 84 months. So 84 months in total is seven years. So this is a seven-year period of tribulation that's broken into two halves. The first half is, is going to be bad, but the Antichrist will look like the saviour of the world, but the second half will be absolute heartache like the world has never seen. And I must just say, it's amazing that John the Baptist's ministry lasted for three and a half years where he prepared the way of the Lord and Jesus' ministry also lasted for three and a half years, making an exact time frame of seven years. Amazing how we had that same period. I hope you understand how we get to these figures. There will also be great evangelism. People who have heard this message and read the Bible, other people think, oh, I remember my brother, my mum, my aunt, whoever. My dad told me about these things. And they will get born again in this period called tribulation. And we believers now should be constantly praying for that generation of believers because they will see things we couldn't even dream of. And we need to pray for them. Amen? There will be many signs that will warn that Jesus is on his way to bring final judgment, but most will choose to ignore them. Just as they ignored in the days of Noah and the ark, so the generations will choose to ignore. Then the second event, uh, sorry, then the second of coming, at the end of this period called tribulation, you will end up with the Antichrist and his armies all gathering around in Jerusalem, fighting one another, uh, uh, believers in Jerusalem stuck there, and till eventually the earth will fall into utter silence. And at that point, Jesus will begin to ascend with his holy ones with him. That will be us. Hallelujah. The earth will be stopped. Man will be hushed. There will be complete silence and terror on the earth. And even in those moments, God in his grace will still open the door for salvation. The Messiah, Jesus, will begin to return. This is known as Armageddon. Jesus, the Messiah, will come and as he left this earth, leaving from the Mount of Olives, he will return again to the Mount of Olives in Israel to the judgment seat to judge the nations of the earth. Those who have been raptured and the believers who have died before will return with him. Jesus will be dressed in red as one who has trod the winepress. And the believers will be dressed in white in the righteousness of Christ. All the armies will be gathered at this point and suddenly the armies and Antichrist will at this point take their eyes off of fighting one another, take their eyes off of Israel as such. And then turn to say, let's war against Jesus. Let's war against God. But of course, there is no war. Jesus has already said it is finished. All the armies will be gathered at this point. And we get the word Armageddon from a word called uh, Megid uh, Megiddo. Megiddo is in northern Israel. And it's actually Ha, Ha. Megiddo. And we get the word Armageddon from that location in northern Israel. Uh, and it's a place of final battle. And that's where the word Armageddon comes. Okay, so when you see it splashed all across uh, the latest blockbuster video, in actual fact, they've just taken it from the Bible. And little did we know. At this battle, as everything is intensified, Antichrist will be defeated. There will be no battle. Jesus will just return and that will be it in his glory and in his power and his church, his bride with him. However, as Jesus returns, 
it will mean the end for humanity. The last second of grace at this time will be over. The unbelievers will be taken for judgment. He will judge the sheep from the goat and he will remove the goats whilst the sheep, the believers in this time of tribulation will be saved. The unbelievers, those who have rejected Jesus as Messiah, will be taken with the demonic realm into hell, while the believers stay on the earth. This is what Revelation 19 verse 6 describes, and it says, Then I heard what sounded like great multitudes, like the roar of rushing waters, like perils of thunder. I love it the way uh, John, he says like. He doesn't say it is the roaring of rushing waters or it is the perils. He said it's like it because he can't fully describe things. And that's what always makes me laugh about people who have visions of heaven and hell and they can describe everything perfectly. Uh, there's not one a uh, New Testament believer who had a vision or experienced heaven, they always struggle to say what it was like because of the glory and the majesty. Shouting hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad. Give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. In fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Wonderful. Can you imagine that scene after such horror and devastation on the earth, suddenly it comes to an end. The tribulation will finish when the Lord returns with his bride, glorious, to judge those on the earth who have died since uh, the rapture. The believers who have died will be the guests of the wedding feast. Verse 9 says, the guests of the wedding supper will be those followers of Christ during the tribulation, those who endured. And it says, then we will go on to live a thousand years on the earth, which is called the age of the millennium. Satan, at this point, will be kept in a bottomless pit, known as the abyss, for a thousand years. So we, the church, will reign on the earth with Jesus for a thousand years, and whilst that is happening simultaneously, Satan will be kept in a bottomless pit known as the abyss for that period of time. This is what Matthew 24, 40 says. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. This isn't talking about the, the rapture. Most believe this is talking about the second coming of Christ. And it is the unbeliever who is removed whilst the believer stays on the earth. It's the opposite to the rapture. At the rapture, it's the believer who is removed and caught up to the sky, while the unbeliever is left on the earth. At the second coming, it is the unbelievers who are removed from the earth, whilst the believers remain. The Jews had always believed that the, uh, it was the removal of the unbelievers that took place at this point, as it did in the Old Testament, i.e. in the days of Noah's ark, it was the unbelievers who died and removed, it was Noah and his righteous family, even in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, in Lot's time, again in Genesis 19, God removes the ungodly, so it will be with the second coming. After the millennium rule, we would have reigned for a thousand years in absolute bliss and wonder with Jesus, living in health, wealth, glory. Satan, it says, after a thousand years, 
will be released for a short time until God, along with all the unbelievers, along with all the demonic realm, every fallen angel will be sent to Gehenna, which is the lake of fire for eternity. That's where people get this image of hell as such. But it's the lake of fire and eventually Satan and um, all the unbelievers who, who rebelled against the, the belief in Jesus as the Messiah, everyone who rejected God, though he has loved us and desired us, uh, but given us free will, will end up in that place. God will destroy the earth and the heavens. So the earth and the heavens, after we've lived here for a millennia, a thousand years, Satan and uh, all the unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire and finally God will destroy this earth. This earth will be destroyed. The heavens, the universe will all be wiped away. And Revelation 21 verse 1 says this, Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now amongst the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. The old order, the old creation. That creation that was polluted in the Garden of Eden by Satan himself, by that parasite of sin that has plagued humanity, will come to an end. In the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no weeds, there will be no fallen state, there will be no dead animals, there will be no thunderstorms, there will be no rebellion, there will be no sin. There will be no racism, there will be no sexism, there will be no ageism, there will just be no isms. It's just wonderful. Man will be in an eternal state with God the Father and we will rule and we will reign in the new heavens and the new earth forever and ever and ever. And we will live with our soon and coming King and all the believers together united we will see our loved ones again there will be no pain there will be no cancer there will be no covid 19 there will be no parasite of sin there will be no uh heartache there will be no tears there will be no sorrow and there will be no regret, there will be no shame, there will be no disaster, there will be no earthquake, there will be no global warming, there be, will be no genocide, there will be no war, there will be no false prophet, there will be no prophecies, there will be glory, the glory of the Messiah. Our God, our soon and coming King in all his glory, with all his angels numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousand times ten thousand. And we will worship and reign and rule forever and ever and ever and ever. What joy, what hope, what precious good news. How can we flirt when such glory is ahead of us? If you're not a believer, there is still time for you. There's still an opportunity. You are still in the hour of grace. Turn to Jesus. Get right with Jesus. Contact us. We'll pray with you and for you. He loves you. You can face these things with a confidence, almost with an excitement, because we know where we stand in Christ. 
Today is the day of salvation. And you might say, well, I'm not worthy, but the blood of Jesus says you are worthy. You might say, but I keep sinning, I'm not good enough and I can't do it. Hallelujah, the penny dropped. You can't do it. That's why Jesus did it for you. Salvation is a free gift. It's not a, 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 a gift of God to man, a man to God, a work of man to God. The one minute we're in because we're doing good, then we're out because we're backslidden, then we're in again, then we're out again, then we're in again doing the hokey pokey. It is a guarantee of eternal life by the most precious shepherd of all. And if you're a Christian, my friend, stop flirting. Don't flirt with God. Give yourself completely. Don't just give yourself to God in times of trouble, but in times of plenty as well. Get back to church. Get yourself back into church, back into fellowship. Stop kidding yourself that you, you're all right at home. You're not all right at home. You have a role to play in the life of the church and the bride of Christ. God paid for you. He paid for your salvation. Use it wisely with fear and trembling wherever you live. And you might say, oh, but the church has let me down. Well, hallelujah, the church has let me down time and time again. I felt betrayed, but I know my God and I know my word and nothing will change the fact that he is faithful despite what I experienced. Like Luke preached last week, do not live your life based on your experiences. Live it on the infallible promises of the word of God. Hallelujah. Oh, I get excited. I can't help myself. I can't help myself. I encourage you, believer, Christian, you, it's not enough for you to just sit at home and be wasted. Put your hands to the plough. And you may say, well, I've got no gift and I've got this, I've got that, I haven't been in fellowship for you. It doesn't matter, hallelujah. Put your hands to the plough. God has a purpose for you. One of the biggest crimes would be for a believer to live their life on earth without living it in the purposes of God. You might still get to heaven, but my brother and sister, what time you would have wasted. To me, it's clear the order of events which will take place as scripture shows. Now, we've just gone, and this is just a little dibble dabble in. This is just peering in. It's not a proper study. We will do one. Forgive me for, for that. We will. So, scripture points to the removal of the church. If we look at things today, we can see exactly where we are. We'll just look at the corruption even within the church, and you can see it. Second, uh, uh, Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion, but to live self-controlled, upright lives, godly lives in this present age. While we wait, some translations say, while we look for the blessed hope of the appearance of the glory of our great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do good works. We can't purify ourselves. We have to rely on the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus, to wash us clean. It doesn't say look for signs of the Antichrist. It doesn't say look for signs of the abomination. It says look for signs of the Saviour. Because Jesus is coming to collect his church. This is the next big page turner. His bride ready to be received, just like a bride on the day of her wedding. All them years ago on, in, in the Israel, Israelite community, she would be standing, waiting, ready, knowing that her bridegroom is on his way. And as he picks up and she gets into the carriage, 
That is it. As Jesus raptures his church, as he calls us to be home with him, that is it. Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation for who? For those who are in Christ Jesus. Stop living under condemnation of what people think and what people say. Judge yourself soberly, says the word of God. Because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Sin and death is a law, but it's not a law that any longer has authority over us. Hallelujah. In closing. Paul sent another letter to the church in Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Because there were false teachers around at the time and they were talking about end times and they were talking about the great tribulation and Paul writes a letter to them uh, to bring, bring clarity that the Antichrist would have had to have been revealed if they were in the great tribulation and that the Antichrist had not been revealed at that point uh, until God removed the restraint of the Holy Spirit in the church. So the end will not come until the rapture of the church takes place. The books of Revelations also speak of the rapture. Uh, in chapters one, uh, sorry, in chapters two and three, or the letters two and three, and both Revelation 2, 7 and 3, 6 say the same thing. And it says, whoever hears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let me say that again. Whoever hears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the introduction. After this verse, this phrase of introduction is not used again. You can look at Revelation 13 verse 9 and it says, If anyone is able to hear, let him listen or let him hear. But the previous one say, whoever is able to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Why? Because this church is still around in the early part of Revelation. But once it's moved on, the church has been raptured. And so now it's not addressed to the church. Amen. This is the hope that we have, that we will be removed from the earth or our descendants and we will go before the great tribulation. We will return with Jesus at the second advent, whether we've been raptured or whether we died before, we're coming back for Armageddon with Jesus. Hallelujah. And we will be involved in this amazing event. For this knowledge should not cause us to sit back and pat ourselves on the back, but it should cause us to open our heart to the prodigals. It should cause us to open our heart to the unbelievers. It should cause us to be ready to witness to all those who ask for a reason why we have the hope that we have in this day and age. And we must uh, walk and let Jesus shine through us. It's not our job to be perfect because we're imperfect, but it's our job to be full of love and full of grace. Be careful of false doctrines like uh, Mr. Camping of this world who put on times and dates because even Jesus said he doesn't know the time or date, but we certainly need to be ready. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, For the Spirit... God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. Hallelujah. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The righteous are as bold as a lion. You know, you never see timid lions looking out, worrying, concerned of the prey. Whatever. You see these lions are just bold. They're the lion, the king of the jungle. Hallelujah. And we need to be bold in our conviction. Revelation 12 verse 11, they triumphed over him, talking about Satan, they triumphed over him with the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love 
their lives so much that they even shrank back from death. What confidence. Hallelujah. Last scripture, 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, like labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day, so we do not belong to the night or darkness. So then, let us not be like those others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether awake or asleep, we may live together in him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Hallelujah. I love this verse because it says that we are to be in love. Hallelujah. To act in love, to walk in love, to give grace. So, you know what? No bitterness, no resentment, no racism, no hatred, no self-seeking. Read 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter of what love really is. And that is the identi- the true identity of the believer. Not your head knowledge, not how much theology you know. It's what you do with the faith that you have. And as my son always says, it's not even how much faith you have. It's who you place your faith in. Hallelujah. One of the most dangerous lies out there isn't that there's no God or there's no hell. One of the most dangerous lies of Satan is that there is no hurry. Oh, I'll get myself right at some point. Oh, just before I die, I'll get right. Oh, I will put right with this person. Oh, I will find restoration at some point. I'm sure I'll bump into them, so on and so forth. We're making excuses. Today is the day of salvation. We're to live our life as though Jesus died yesterday, rose today, and is coming back tomorrow. If that's how you will live in your life, I guarantee, me included, we will be living it differently. Hallelujah. I pray that you're blessed. I hope you followed that. I know, I know it wasn't very deep or whatnot, but I hope it's just given you a rough timetable to the end. The resurrection of Jesus, the 2,000 year reign or life of church, the the rapture of the church, which is believers being called off of the earth, the seven year tribulation broken into two halves, the Armageddon, the return of Jesus and his saints and those who have died all together with him along with all his angels, the judgment of of the believer and non-believers, or or certainly the the non-believers, to punishment and the believers of their good works. The thousand-year bottomless pit, the abyss of Satan, where he will be enchained. Then Satan being released for a short time, until eventually Satan and all those who have rejected Christ and the demonic realm being cast into the pit, the everlasting fire. And then finally, the total destruction of this present earth, this universe, these heavens, to be perceived or to, to be followed by the new earth, the new heavens, and the new Jerusalem, which is the eternal state of the believer. Hallelujah. God bless you. I pray that you're encouraged. Please share, please contact us. We're hoping to be back in our church building extremely soon. You can come and celebrate with us. Let's keep our hands on the plough in Jesus' name. God bless you. 
Take care. Bye-bye.